Hello, Livestream family and friends. Believe it or not, today is Palm Sunday, the day we celebrate Jesus' coming into Jerusalem, thus beginning our Holy Week. Uh, before we go too much further, I want to give a huge shout out to Sheila, who this week single-handedly is leading us in worship, so make sure that you're messaging or calling her throughout the week, uh, sharing some love with her. And we're very, very appreciative of her and all her hard work, especially in this time when we can't meet together in the flesh. But today is Palm Sunday. We're going to have a special service today. And uh, later on, we're going to have a few announcements. And throughout the week, you'll be receiving emails about how our Easter service is going to go and uh, even what we're going to do about our voting. This is a very special time for us, isn't it? We got Holy Week, we got Easter, and we've got the voting for the, uh, the pastoral candidate. So uh, make sure you're checking your emails and all. We'll have a few announcements later in the service, but uh, let's open today in some prayer. And God, we do celebrate this day when we, uh, we just rejoice in your coming to Jerusalem with shouts of Hosanna, you know, save us, O son of David. We pray that you would be with us, that you would guide us and direct us, and that you would come again soon, Lord, but not too soon. We pray that the ministries we engage in, those separate, would be effective and that you would bless us and use us in this time. We love you, God, so, so much. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let us worship well today. Well, good morning, live stream. Um, I know that, again, we can't be together today. Um, I just want to, you know, be with you all and celebrate Palm Sunday. And we'll just have to pretend we're waving our palm branches and welcoming the king um, so if you would like stand um, now's a great time to wave your arms when nobody's looking and uh, let's just praise him this morning
We're just going to continue worshiping him this morning. I know that it's hard when we're not together, but we need to find that, that peaceful place that he is. And we're just going to bless his name this morning. This week, as you read the word of the Lord, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and go around the room and each of you read a verse. So one of you reads one verse and then the next person reads the next verse and go around the room uh, reading the word of the Lord like that. Still read it aloud, of course, and uh, read it as if it's speaking to you. The Psalms are really cool about that, full of emotion, full of excitement, full of sadness. So go ahead and read them with the emotions that are, are appropriate. So. Go ahead and pause the video and hear the word of the Lord. We're just going to continue worshiping. And, you know, the Bible says that even the rocks will cry out and praise him. And sometimes it feels like we live in a place that, you know, that's what he's waiting for to happen because there's, there's not many people praising him. Um, I'm just hoping that during this time, um, this, this bad time, that God is going to bring something wonderful out of it. And that we're just going to um, get a renewed um, spirit and uh, turn our eyes to him. And, uh, and all of creation will praise him.
part in our service now where we go to the Lord in prayer. It is significant that together as a community uh, we approach his throne. Now obviously we certainly come with needs today and there are things we want to lift to him. But it's also as I, as I talked about last week, it's time to recalibrate as well. 
one of the ways is that, that I talked about last week uh, is by going to scripture. And let me encourage you again to find a psalm that really speaks to you right now and just camp out in it, meaning read it every day and uh, let, it, let it speak to your heart. Another of my favorites is Psalm 27. Let me just read the first few verses to you this morning. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his tabernacle will I sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Another way in which we recalibrate is by going to prayer. Would you join me this morning? Our Father, we do come to you with needs, concerns, things that are on our hearts. But we also want to focus on you and to remember who you really are. We praise you that you are an all-knowing God. We, we praise you that there's not one thing that has happened in our world, in our nation, in our communities the last couple of weeks that has surprised you. We pr praise you that you know everything about us. You know every concern. You know every heartache. You know every suffering. We're resting in that. We, we praise you that you are all wise, that you know best. We openly confess that we do not. Thank you that you know what's best and even now are at work on our behalf. We praise you that you're all loving. We praise you that you love us beyond our comprehension. We praise you that you love us so much that you sent your one and only son to this earth to live among us and to experience life as we experience it. That gives us comfort. Father, as we enter into Holy Week today, would you remind us of what your love did for us through your son, Jesus. Would you take us to Calvary and help us to see him suffering and dying for us so that we might come to know you? Would you take us to next Sunday, the resurrection? Would you help us to see that we serve a living savior? Father, thank you that even remotely, digitally today, it is your spirit who gathers us together. We do have needs and concerns. We pray for our nation. We pray for our world. We pray for those uh, who are suffering today. Lord, the, the thousands, tens of thousands around the world that are suffering from this virus. Lord, would you intervene on their behalf? Would you relieve their suffering? Would you bring them back to health? We pray for those who are caring for them and caring for us as a, as a community. We pray for our doctors and our nurses and our other medical technicians. We pray for the first responders like law enforcement and fire workers and, and, and those who go on EMS. Father, would you be with them? Would you protect them? Would you provide them with the equipment they so desperately need? Father, we pray for those who are grieving. We know there are thousands of families that are grieving the loss of loved ones today. Would you wrap them in your arms? Would you provide your comfort? 
Father, we pray for those who are being dramatically impacted financially. Oh, Father, would you, would you provide for them in ways they cannot begin to imagine? And would you make us sensitive to those around us with needs so that we might respond, that we might be your hands and feet? Father, in the midst of all this big picture, we pray for our congregation today. In the pastoral search process, we have come to the time for a pastoral vote. Father, would you be in this today? Would you guide? Would you direct? Would you give us wise discernment? We want the person to come and be the shepherd of this congregation that you have designated. Oh, Father, make your will clear today. Thank you that we can come to you at any time in any place. Lord, help us to avail ourselves of this privilege on a very regular basis. For I pray it in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. At this time, we get one of the, what I think is one of the coolest parts of our service, and that's the meet and greet. So as we've been doing, go ahead in a few moments and pause the video and send out a text, an email, give a phone call to someone. It doesn't have to be in the church, but it could be a neighbor. Just check in on them. Let them know you're praying for them. Pass the peace of Christ to them. And it's always cool to me to see at what time people are engaging uh, with our video services. I'll get messages at, you know, 10 in the morning saying, hey, you know, praying for you, meet and greet time. Then I'll get one at 8 that night saying the same exact thing. So whenever you're watching this, feel free to reach out to someone, meet and greet them uh, using your phone, your computer, Snapchat, however, and uh, pass the peace of Christ to them today. I'm so excited you guys joined us this morning for worship. Um, I know that we all miss each other and especially going into this coming Holy Week, I know that our hearts are just broken. We all, we wanna be together. We all, you know, wanna celebrate and go through all of the things we do every year. And this is another thing that has been, had to look a lot differently than we thought it would and so, um, I'm praying for you guys this week, and please keep an eye out on your emails um, for some resources or different things that we'll send out this week. Also, please continue to give up is your regular online giving or text to give or if you're sending in a check, whatever it is. Um, the work of the church, again, it does not stop just because we're not gathering together, um, and we all just... We love you guys, we miss you guys, and hope that as soon as we can, we will all be back together. Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well this morning. Well, we're here. We are gonna be voting for our next lead pastor today. Please let me read for you a letter from Dr. David Bowser regarding this matter. Dear members and friends of Lifestream Church of the Nazarene, greetings in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. On this Sunday, we gather in ways that the early church gathered in the books of Acts. Although we are not gathered together in one place, we are one because he is with us. This morning, it will be our privilege to conduct a historical election in the life of this church. Pastoral congregational votes have always been conducted in person by those who were present and met the manual requirements. In a few moments, or maybe you have already, you will receive an email invitation from Election Runner with instructions on how to cast your digital vote for Lifestream's next lead pastor. It is a simple process and will require you to follow instructions that are similar to those that would be given if you were all present today. Members of the church will be invited to vote electronically and friends of the church will also be given the opportunity to vote electronically on a separate ballot. The opportunity will be available for you to vote from 10 a.m. until 2 p.m. Once you have voted, you will submit your vote. After that, you are through with the balloting process. Your church board secretary, that's me, will receive the results sometime Sunday afternoon and will be responsible for reporting them to the congregation. I will immediately report the results 
to Pastor Jerry for his continued prayerful consideration. Be assured of my prayers for you as you vote on the future of his church. Grace and peace, Dr. David Bowser. And just as a reminder, we are voting for a new pastor, Pastor Jared, a yes or a no. Please don't confuse that with the process about whether you thought it took too long or you just didn't like parts of the process. Again, that's a different matter. That's at a district level. Keep in mind we're voting for um, a new pastor. Have a great day. Well, as you well know, today is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, among other things, is the entrance into Holy Week. Very significant week in the Christian calendar because this is the center of our faith. Can you picture that first Palm Sunday with me? Jesus is heading to Jerusalem. When he reaches the Mount of Olives, he, uh, he sends two of his disciples to the village ahead of him. Their assignment? Uh, to find a donkey's colt that no one has ever ridden before. Jesus tells them just where to find it and just what to say should anyone question why they're taking the colt. The disciples obey Jesus' instructions and lo and behold, they bring the colt back to Jesus. Well, at this, the disciples throw their cloaks onto the back of the donkey and help Jesus to mount it. So now, he is riding down the main road leading into Jerusalem on the back of this donkey. Now the road is crowded with both locals and pilgrims who are heading into Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. Word quickly spreads that the young rabbi from Galilee, about whom they have heard so, so much, is heading to Jerusalem, and guess what? He's riding on the back of a donkey. With, with messianic fever always running high at Passover, the crowd quickly picks up on the symbolism of Jesus riding on the donkey's colt uh, down this road, and uh, they get it because you see the prophet Zechariah had predicted that this is exactly how the Messiah would come. More and more people keep joining the parade. They are hailing Jesus as king and shouting messianic slogans as they wave palm branches to uh, greet him. Some take off their outer cloaks and lay them right there on the dirt road to act as a carpet for their new king. The people just can't get enough of Jesus. This is the absolute pinnacle of his popularity. Now, let's fast forward a mere five days. It's Friday. And we find ourselves out here in a small hill just outside the city gates of Jerusalem, uh, right here in the middle of the municipal garbage dump. We look up and see a familiar face. There is Jesus hanging on a Roman cross. What in the world happened? How did we ever get here? Well, obviously, a lot has happened in the last five days. The attitude toward Jesus all began to shift when the moment Jesus entered Jerusalem riding on the back of that donkey. You see, instead of turning toward the Roman garrison to throw out the hated Romans, something the crowd all expected him to do, Jesus turns towards the temple. When he entered the temple, Jesus was absolutely appalled. Instead of it being a place of prayer and worship, it was a marketplace and a corrupt one at that. So Jesus began turning over the tables and driving out the vendors and the money exchangers, shouting, it is written, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Well, from that point on, the tensions, the conflict, the friction between Jesus 
and the religious leaders had escalated dramatically. The leaders had continued to attempt to trip Jesus up and get him to say something that would destroy his credibility in the eyes of the people, but without success. So finally, the leaders concluded that the only solution to their Jesus problem was this. He must be eliminated, executed, killed. So they began to plot and concoct their plan. This plan was implemented last night on what we call Monday Thursday. While Jesus and his disciples were praying in the garden, guards from the high priest came and arrested Jesus and took him to the house of the high priest. Here he was immediately put on trial on false charges. The trial lasted all night, even though it was a foregone conclusion from the very beginning. Finally, Jesus was found to be guilty and worthy of death. At daybreak, Jesus was taken to Pilate, the Roman governor. You see, the Jewish leaders do not have the authority to impose the death sentence. Only Pilate has that power. So they bring him to Pilate. Now, Pilate knows that Jesus is innocent, and he maneuvers in, in several ways to try to have Jesus released. But at the provocation of the religious leaders, the crowd shouted Pilate down, demanding Jesus to be crucified. So Pilate finally caved in and agreed to Jesus' execution. At this point, Jesus was turned over to the Roman soldiers who led him out to this hill. They quickly nailed his hands and feet to his cross lifted it high in the air and dropped it into a hole in the ground with a sudden thud. Then the soldiers settled in, knowing that crucifixion is a long, slow, agonizing form of execution that inflicts maximum pain and suffering. It's designed to be that way. Now, in the first few hours, there was a great deal of activity out here on this hill. The angry mob and their leaders sarcastically hurled insults at Jesus. Uh, there had been a bit of controversy over the message board that Pilate ordered to be nailed above Jesus on his cross. The Roman soldiers had passed some of their idle time by gambling, rolling the dice for his clothes. Jesus even had a couple of short conversations, one with the repentant criminal on the cross next to him, the other with a small group of followers who were keeping vigil at the foot of the cross. But at noon, everything changed. Up until now, the sun had been shining brightly, but suddenly darkness shrouded the entire land. The mood and the feeling tone had shifted dramatically. The crowd had become much, much quieter. There's an eerie feeling in the air. And it's been this way for three hours now. Even Jesus has been suffering in silence, not having uttered a word since noon. But now, as death draws near, Jesus begins to speak again. In the last few minutes of his life, Jesus makes four unique individual statements, making one, then regathering his strength in order to make another. Piercing the eerie silence, Jesus cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is the cry of abandonment. Jesus feels totally deserted by his Father. He does not sense the presence of God one little bit. He who is sinless is experiencing the full fury and consequences of sin. Then in a few moments, we hear Jesus speaking again. I am thirsty. 
Yes, he's expressing the thirst of horrible dehydration. That is one of the outcomes of crucifixion. But there is more here. Jesus is voicing his thirst for lost, dying humanity. He is yearning for his people to come to know God. In just a few more moments, we hear Jesus clearing his throat and shouting, It is finished. Sure, his terrible suffering is about to come to an end, but it is far more than that. His mission of redemption is finished. His victory over sin and the power of evil is completed. So now we wait, watch, listen. Has, has Jesus spoken for the last time? No, there, there is one more word. We see Jesus struggling with all of his remaining strength to, to raise up and get one last breath. And then we hear his concluding words. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. With this, we, he, we see his head slump forward and his body go limp. It's over. Death has finally come to Jesus. As we stand here numb and in utter disbelief, we can't help but repay, Je replay Jesus' last statement over and over and over again in our minds. He's once again quoting from the Psalms, this time Psalm 31, verse 5. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Commit. Now that, that's an interesting word that we occasionally use. Um, it's been observed that many in our culture seem to be allergic to commitment. To commit means to entrust, to devote, to pledge, to take a vow. Marriage vows, for instance, are certainly a form of serious, significant, sustained commitment. To commit is to give oneself completely. So what are we to make of Jesus' seventh and final statement here from the cross? What does Jesus mean? Well, perhaps it will help us if, if we just ask a couple of questions. The first is this. What is Jesus committing? That he's making a commitment with his last final breath really shouldn't surprise us. Uh, we hear Jesus making commitments over and over and over again throughout his ministry. We hear it often on his lips. You know, often in death, we are, we are what we were in life. And so that Jesus is using his last breath to make commitment uh, doesn't exactly surprise us. But what does Jesus mean by, I commit my spirit? Well, he certainly is committing his life and ministry. Jesus has now been on his earthly journey for about 33 years. Uh, his public ministry has taken up the last three years. During this time, Jesus has done a number of things. He has befriended the poor and healed the sick. His ministry has included confronting hypocrisy, immorality, twisted beliefs. Repeatedly, he has taught about the true nature of God the real values of the kingdom, and how to be in right relationship with God. Jesus has given every last ounce of energy and effort that he had to advancing God's will and work. But now this time is coming to a close. So he is committing all that he has said and done, not knowing if they have had their intended impact. But there's more. Jesus is also committing the incongruence of his death. I mean, is this really the way his life is to end? Is God's chosen one, the Messiah, to die such a humiliating, agonizing death? He's committing even 
his horrible ending. But there's even more. Jesus is committing his mission. He had come to earth with a, a specific mission from his father. With fervency, he has endeavored to accomplish this mission. He has now entrusted its continuance into the hands of 12 men, one of whom has already betrayed him and the others of whom have deserted him. Has he really accomplished his mission? I mean, after all, there are no do-overs here. On the surface, many would say that it has just ended in shambles, that Jesus has totally failed. So we hear Jesus committing his mission and whether he has successfully fulfilled it. When Jesus prays, into your hands I commit my spirit, it is complete, total commitment. He's holding nothing back. Everything about him, his past, his present, his future, is devoted to his Father. Now, remember, that Jesus is making this commitment in the dark. Nothing has changed since a few minutes ago when Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? No lights have come on since then. There is still this deep sense of abandonment. There is still no sense of the Father's presence. As John Richard Newhouse points out, it is one thing to entrust when the results are clear. It is quite another when the circumstances seem to contradict the promise. So how can he make this kind of commitment in these circumstances? Well, this, this leads us directly to our second question. To whom is Jesus making this commitment? Listen to Jesus' words again. This is found in, in Luke chapter 23, verse 46. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now, this is interesting, isn't it? Uh, just a few moments ago, we heard Jesus cry, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We have just said that nothing has changed in the last few minutes. No light has come down from heaven. God hasn't thundered as he has on other occasions. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Jesus still has this gnawing, aching, horrible sense of abandonment, feeling like God has deserted him. So why is he now with his last earthly breath calling out to his father, even using a term of close personal affection and endearment. Let me tell you why. Please get this. It is because Jesus trusts in his father's character. The father with whom he co-created the universe, the father who had sent him on a mission of love and salvation, the Father who, with whom he has had such intimate fellowship over these years. The Father who has supplied every one of his needs along this journey. The Father who has faithfully empowered his ministry and given him the courage to see it through to the very end. Jesus is trusting in his Father's character even in the dark. Let me say that again. Jesus is trusting in his Father's character even in the dark. When our kids were little, they loved to play with Daddy. I mean, after all, that makes sense because that's what daddies are for. Daddies play with their kids, mommies do the rest, right? No, but I'd be playing with my kids and, and we'd we would, every once in a while, we'd be roughhousing a bit. Uh, I'd lift them high over my head, and, and, and they'd just giggle like crazy. 
I'd swing them around and around and I, all I'd hear was more daddy, more daddy. Sometimes they would be standing on a relatively high wall with me on the concrete down below. They, they, they love to jump off and let me catch them. They, they, they just want to do it over and over and over again. Now, why were they so enthusiastic about this? Because they trusted their father. Because I had never dropped them once. Because I had never gotten distracted and let them hit the concrete face first getting a bloody nose and a gash on the forehead that required six stitches. Now, can you hear Jesus? Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Into your hands. Jumping off the wall of life as he takes his last breath, Jesus is totally trusting his Father who has never, ever dropped him. He is committing everything, his life, his ministry, his mission, into the hands of his trustworthy Father, leaving the results with him. Now let me pause and ask you a question. Are you like me in that you like immediate feedback? Remember back when you were 16? I know some of us have to think a long ways back. Remember that. Remember back when you were 16? Did you want to wait for two months to get the results of your driving test? Or would, did you really prefer to know immediately whether or not you had passed? We've watched Jesus totally commit his all into his Father's hands as he breathes his last. So how does it turn out? Are there any indicators that his trust was well-founded and that he was right on target? Well, Luke shares a couple of things with us that validate Jesus' trust. One of them occurs at the temple, which is not that far away from this hill. Luke mentions it, but Matthew elaborates on it. At the moment of Jesus' death, in the midst of this eerie darkness that is shrouding the land, on top of that, there is an earthquake. Uh, this tremor causes the curtain in the temple to be torn in two from top to bottom. Now remember the significance of this curtain. This curtain is what divided the holy place from the Holy of Holies. Now, the holy place is where the altar of incense was. The priests regularly ministered in there. And the people could stand outside, and, and if they watched carefully, they'd catch a glimpse now and then of the priests uh, doing their ministry. But the Holy of Holies was sealed off with this curtain. In Hebrew tradition, it was believed that this is where God lived. You want to know God's address? It's in the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem. Only the high priest was allowed to enter the Holy of Holies. And then only once per year. On the Day of, the, of Atonement, the priest would enter burning incense and sprinkling the Ark of the Covenant with blood from the sacrifices for the forgiveness of the people's sins. Now, because no one else could enter, the high priest had bells woven into the hem of his robe and a rope tied around one of his ankles. If his assistants on the outside no longer heard the bells, rather than going into the Holy of Holies to check on the high priest where they're not allowed to go, they would pull him out by the rope. So what is the message in all this symbolism? Access to God is very, very limited. But at Jesus' sacrificial death, everything changes. The curtain is torn in two. Now everyone who was standing there in the temple 
can see right into the Holy of Holies. They know exactly what it looks like now. The message? There is now unlimited access to God because of Jesus' act of atonement. We can now have a personal, intimate relationship with God himself. Through Christ's sacrifice, we can know forgiveness, pardon, peace. Now, the author of the book of Hebrews picks up on this and makes this, this statement, and I want you to listen for it carefully because it's exactly the picture we've just described. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, parentheses, the holy of holies, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened up for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Jesus' mission was to open up the way to God for all of humanity. Mission accomplished. His commitment was incredibly well placed. There's another fascinating story that Luke, Matthew, and Mark share with us. It's about the Roman centurion at the foot of Jesus' cross. Now, remember where this centurion has been and what he has seen and done. He undoubtedly participated in Jesus' torture and humiliation last night. He was there when they beat and whipped Jesus back so long, so brutally, that it looked like raw meat. Uh, this is the soldier who may have been the one who jammed the crown of thorns down into Jesus' head. Today, we'd want to try him for war crimes. The centurion had obviously participated in Jesus' crucifixion. He could have very well been the one who drove the spikes through Jesus' feet and hands. He was one of the soldiers who sat at the foot of the cross and gambled for Jesus' clothing while Jesus hung there in sheer agony. This soldier has, has witnessed the entire ordeal, but this isn't all he witnessed. He couldn't help but notice how Jesus has gone about suffering. There was something different about his, his spirit and attitude. The centurion had heard Jesus' first statement from the cross. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Oh, he'd never before heard anyone extend forgiveness while being executed. Usually they are cursing obscenely. The soldier had overheard, overheard Jesus' conversation with the repentant criminal next to him. Oh, Jesus had been so, so kind, so gentle, so loving. Oh, he hadn't seen that before either. Then this tough, battle-tested warrior watched as Jesus made arrangements for the care of his mother. Most people being crucified are only thinking about themselves. But this Jesus, he's thinking of others. For hours, this rough, tough centurion has been taking it all in. So as Jesus dies, this hardened centurion just can't contain himself any longer and he blurts out, surely this was a righteous man. Matthew and Mark quote him as saying, surely he was a son of a God. Now this soldier isn't a religious man by any means, and so he doesn't have the right vocabulary, vocabulary to describe what he is feeling at this moment. But he knows, he knows in his heart of hearts that what he has just witnessed, witnessed is very, very special. 
this spontaneous witness is another indicator that Jesus has, in fact, accomplished his mission of salvation and that his commitment has been incredibly well placed. Well, let's, let's replay the scene one more time. Jesus is about to gasp his last. As he does, he confidently affirms, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus is committing his all to his Father, even his mission. Well, as we stand here contemplating it all, Jesus' commitment raises questions about our commitment. Like, to whom are we committed? Who are you really serving? It, it's a question that each and every one of us have to answer for ourselves. Is there something you have been needing to commit to your Heavenly Father, but you haven't? How do you need to complete this statement? Father, into your hands I commit my... What is it? What is it you've been holding back from God? Friend, Jesus gave his all for you so that you could know God's forgiveness. Isn't it time that you trust your Father and commit everything, absolutely everything to him? Let's pray. Father, as we stand here looking at the cross, we are in awe. We can't believe anyone would do that for us, let alone the Son of God. We are absolutely amazed at his commitment that he, that, that he followed through to the very end, that even to his last breath he was completing his mission, that he was providing for our salvation, for the forgiveness of our sins, so that we could come to know you personally and we could know you eternally. Father, even in this moment, would you speak to us about our commitment? Would you help us to commit absolutely everything to you? I, I, I pray for that person right now who knows that there's, there, there are, there's, there's some things they have not committed to you. Father, even in this moment, at the foot of the cross, would you help them to lay those things before you and totally commit them to you? For I pray it in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. May the Lord bless you as you go totally trusting your Father. God bless.